Hello. My name is Rick Vandenberg, and I'm a professor of strategy at the Grossman School of Business at the University of Vermont. Over the course of three videos, I will introduce you to the very basics of positive political theory and discuss briefly the implications of the theory for understanding political strategy. For approximately 20 years, I have been conducting research on regulatory institutions and firm political strategy. As a PhD student at the University of California at Berkeley, I learned from preeminent scholars such as Oliver Williamson and Pablo Spiller. Their guidance helped me to develop regulatory models using positive political theory. Please note that I will sometimes refer to positive political theory using the acronym PPT. Since joining the faculty at the University of Vermont in 2000, I've continued my work in PPT and also applied this work to better understand political strategy. Political strategy is about how interest groups try to influence the public policy process to bring about favorable policy outcomes. However, to think about interest group political strategy, it is useful to first develop a model of public policy making. We will use PPT for that purpose. PPT builds on the insights from economics and attempts to derive equilibrium or stable policy outcomes as well as to develop an understanding of what gives rise to changes in equilibrium policy. Please note that there are two broad approaches to studying the decisions of policymakers. One is a prescriptive or a normative approach. With a normative approach, the analyst argues for what policy should be implemented. For example, how should the policymaker design policy to address market failures like negative externalities associated with carbon emissions? The other approach is a descriptive or positive approach. With a positive approach, the analyst attempts to explain and predict what actual public policy decisions emerge and why. PPT is a positive approach that models which policy emerges given the institutional rules governing the process. In this first video, I'm going to introduce you to assumptions for a very basic PPT model and work through the fundamental insight from Duncan Black called the Median Voter Theorem. For a very basic PPT model, we will assume that policy choices take place within a single dimensional policy space. This is a fancy way of saying that policy choices can be arrayed along a line, shown here in blue. The policy space can represent any issue you are studying. For example, it could represent tax rates, where policy could be low taxes, high tax rates, or anything in the middle. The space could represent environmental protection, from weak standards to strong standards. In the United States and in many individual states, such as my home state of Vermont, a policy mandating a minimum hourly wage has been an active issue. For the purposes of this video, I will use the government mandated minimum wage as an example. The second assumption addresses the preferences of the people making policy. These people are elected officials, regulators, judges, even citizens in some cases. We're going to assume that the policymakers have an ideal policy, which they prefer over all others. For example, policymaker number one would most prefer to see a mandated minimum wage of $8 per hour, while policymaker number two has an ideal minimum wage of $9. Generally, policymakers' ideal policies differ from each other. Why? Because they represent different constituencies or have different ideologies. We also assume that policymaker preferences are single peaked. This green curve represents the utility function for policymaker number one, associated with each potential policy outcome. The red curve represents the utility function for policymaker number two. Focusing on policymaker number one, you can see that utility is maximized at the policymaker's ideal and declines as the policy moves away from that ideal. This utility function is a key factor for voting decisions. We are assuming that a politician will vote for a policy it prefers, that is, if it increases utility versus the alternative. In this example, you can see that a minimum wage of $9 provides higher utility than $6.50. So policymaker number one votes for $9 over $6.50. The final assumption we will make today is about how collective action decisions are made. We're going to assume a simple majority rule, which means that for a new policy to pass, 50% plus one of the policymakers have to vote for the policy. This model could be applied to any single institution 
with a simple majority voting rule. For example, legislative referendum in Switzerland or votes of no confidence in parliamentary systems both use simple majority rules. Given these assumptions, we can now turn to answer the, answering the question, is there an equilibrium? By equilibrium, I mean, is the policy stable so that it will not change unless an assumption of the model changes? So let's imagine a simple five-person political institution trying to set a government-mandated minimum hourly wage. Under simple majority, they need three votes for a policy to pass. The policy ideal points for the politicians are represented in this figure. To highlight the concept of equilibrium, let's simply ask whether a minimum wage of $9 per hour is a stable policy. I will use X naught to represent a status quo or current policy. Let's compare X naught to an alternative minimum wage, X subscript A, of $10. Since a minimum wage of $10 is closer to the ideal points of policymakers number three, four, and five, each of these three will vote for $10 over $9. Only policymakers number one and number two will vote against $10 because it moves policy further away from their ideal. With three in favor and two against, the minimum wage policy will change to $10. This, of course, means that $9 is not a stable equilibrium. We can use the same logic to explore if other policies are stable. It turns out that any policy that is not equal to $11 is not a stable equilibrium. The reason is that for any policy not equal to $11, there is an alternative minimum wage proposal that would win a simple majority vote. So let's explore why $11 is an equilibrium outcome. Here I represent an equilibrium policy with X star. For any proposed alternative that increases the minimum wage above $11, policymakers number one, two, and three will vote against it. So $11 wins versus any higher minimum wage proposal. Similarly, for any alternative proposed that decreases the minimum wage below $11, policymakers number three, four, and five will vote against it. So $11 also wins versus lower minimum wage proposals. Notice that policymaker number three is the key voter in both scenarios. Number three will vote against any alternative policy to $11. Also notice that policymaker number three represents the median policymaker. There are two policymakers to the right of number three and two policymakers to the left of number three. This analysis leads to Black's median voter theorem. Given our assumptions, within a single political institution governed by a simple majority collective action rule, the equilibrium policy is located at the median voter's ideal point. From this simple model, we better understand what gives rise to changes in policy. New elections may bring about a different set of policymakers with different ideal policies. Similarly, new information may change the views of constituencies. Either may cause a shift in the median voter's ideal and we will observe policy changes move toward the ideal policy point for the new median voter. In the next video, we're going to look at the implications of changing the voting rules. Thank you.